On one occasion in the ancient time, three warriors set out on an expedition, and they were far distant from their own land. One of them had the misfortune of breaking his leg. By Indian law, it became the duty of others to bring their injured comrade back to his home. A rude litter, and laying him upon it, bore him for some distance. At length they came to a ridge of mountains. The way was hard and the exertion severe. To rest themselves, they placed their burden on the ground. They withdrew to a distance and took evil counsel together. There was a deep opening into the ridge of the mountain at a short distance from the place where they were sitting. Returning to the litter, they took up their helpless load, carried him near the brink of the pit, and suddenly hurled him in. <coughs> then they set off rapidly for their own country. When they arrived, they reported that he had died of wounds received in a fight. Great was the grief of his mother, a widow, whose only support he had been. To soothe her feelings, they told her that her son had fallen into the enemy hands. They had rescued him, they said, from that fate, had carefully tended him in his last hours, and had given him remains of the coming burial. They little imagined that he was still alive. When he was thrown down by his treacherous comrades, he lay for some time insensible at the bottom of the pit. When he recovered his senses, he observed an old gray-headed man seated near him, crouching into a cavity on one side of the pit. Ah, my son, what have your friends done to you? They have thrown me down here to die, I suppose. You shall not die if you will promise to do what I require of you and for, in return for saving you. What is that? Only that when you recover, you will remain here and hunt for me and bring me the game that you kill. The young warrior readily promised, and the old man applied herbs to his wound and attended him skillfully until he recovered. This happened in the autumn. All through the winter, the youth hunted in service of the old man, who told him that whenever he killed a game too large for one man to carry, he would come himself and help to carry it to the pit in which they continued to reside. Then spring arrived, bringing melting snows and frequent showers. He continued to his pursuit of game, though with more difficulty. One day he encountered an enormous bear, which he was lucky enough to kill. As he stooped to feel its fatness and judge its weight, he heard a murmur of voices behind him. He had not imagined that any human beings would find their way to that lonely region at that time of year. Astonished, he turned and saw two men, or figures in the shapes of men, clad in strange cloud-like garments standing near him. Who are you? In reply, they informed him that they were the Thunders. They told him that their mission was to keep the earth and everything upon it in good order for the benefit of the human race. If there was a drought, it was their duty to bring rain. If there were serpents or other noxious creatures, they were commissioned to destroy them and ensure to do away with everything injurious to mankind. They told him that their present objective was to destroy the old man whom he had bound his service to, and who, as they would show him, was a very different sort of being from what he pretended to be. For this, they required his aid. If he would assist them, he would do a good act, and they would convey him back to his home, where he would see his mother and be able to take care of her. This proposal and their assurances overcame any reluctance the young man might have felt to sacrifice his seeming benefactor. He went to him and told him that he had killed a bear and needed his help to bring it home. The old man was anxious and uneasy. He bade the youth examine the sky carefully and see if there were the smallest speck of cloud visible. The young man replied that the sky was perfectly clear. The old man then came out of the hollow and followed the young hunter, urging him constantly to make haste and looking upward with great anxiety. When they reached the bear, they cut it up hurriedly with their knives, and the old man directed the youth to place it all on his shoulders. The youth complied, though much astonished at his companion's strength. The old man set off hastily for the pit. Just then, a cloud appeared and thunder rumbled in the distance. The old man threw down his load and started to run. The thunder rumbled near, and the old man assumed his proper form of an enormous porcupine, which fled through the bushes, discharging its coils like arrows backwards as it ran. But the thunder followed him, with burst upon burst, and finally a bolt struck a huge animal, which fell lifeless into its den. Then the thunderer said to the young man, now that we have done our work here, we will take you to your home and your mother, who is grieving for you all the time. They gave him a dress like that which they wore, a cloud-like robe, having wings on its shoulders, and they told him how they were to be moved. It was day. He went to her cabin and drew aside the mat which covered the opening. The widow started up and gazed at him in the daylight with terror, thinking that she saw her son's ghost. He guessed her thoughts. 
Do not be alarmed, mother. It is no ghost. I'm, it is your son back to take care of you. As may be supposed, the poor woman was overjoyed and welcomed her long lost son with delight. He remained with her, fulfilling his duties as a son for the rest of the year. What was done to his treacherous comrades is not recorded. They were too insignificant to be further noticed in the story, which now assumes a more decided mythological character. Accordingly, the youth hid the dress in the woods so that no one might see it, and awaited until the spring. Then the thunder was returned, he resumed the robe, and floated with them in the clouds over the earth. As they passed above a mountain, he became thirsty, and seeing a pool below, he descended to drink of it. When he rejoined his companions, they looked at him, and saw that the water with, with which his lips were moist had caused them to shine as if smeared with oil. Where have you been drinking? They asked him eagerly. The pool down yonder. He answered, pointing to where it still lay in sight. There is something in that pool that we must destroy. We have sought it for years, and now you have happily found it for us. They cast a mighty thunderbolt into the pool, which presently became dry. At the bottom of it, blasted by thunder, was an immense grove of the kind which destroys the corn and beans and other products in the fields and gardens. But this was a vast creature, as big as a house, a special patron and representative of all groves. Accompanying his spirit friends to some distance, and seeing more of their good deeds of the sort, the youth returned home and told his men that the thunder was their divine protector, and narrated the proofs which he had witnessed of this character. Thence originated the honor in which the thunder is held among the Indians. Many Iroquois still call Hina their grandfather.